So I'm going to go ahead and start recording here. Um, just I just looked in chat there. Heather asked a question, how long will the voucher be good for? Usually the voucher, we ask that, um, you know, if you go and get the voucher today, hopefully that you'll take the exam within 30 days. Because what we have found, you know, if someone registers for the, um, to get the voucher and then um, they don't have a goal in mind or a date set in mind that they want to take the exam, they may never take the exam. So um, the LTC um, does have to pay for the vouchers. So that's why if you, you know, not for sure when you're going to take it, you can always come back and fill out the voucher um, later on. But if you know you're going to take it within the next 30 days, go ahead and fill out that voucher, put in your test date, and um, then you'll be one less thing you have to do later on. So great question. All right, here on slide um, 38, if you've already used Blogger, I've got some links here um, for some blogs out there. Again, do you have to use Blogger? No, you don't. It's just another tool that is out there that you and or and your students can use. If you don't see it, um, if you don't have access to it, you might wanna jump over to your personal Google account um, and look at it there. Because um, some school districts, they haven't turned it on. Um, no, sometimes they don't turn some apps on out there if teachers aren't asking, hey, I would like to use this app. Um, it is in everyone's um, G Suite for Education account, but whether the, um, Google admin has enabled it or not is another question. And sometimes they don't know that it's not enabled. Um, Blogger is just what it exactly is. It is um, a blog people can um, post to and then post on the uh, website. Um, if you've used the Blogger before, I have um, the challenge here on slide 39 that you can go ahead to. But if not, um, I'll walk you through it. How I always go to it is I open up a new tab and then type in blogger.com. And as I type it in, it just pops up for me. And then I have that symbol there, um, blogger. I don't, you know, I'm just, as I'm saying this, I'm thinking, is it over here in the apps? I honestly don't know. Um, I don't see it in mine. So I guess that's why I just started typing in blogger.com. If anybody sees it in their um, apps over here, let me know. I guess I've never went out and looked for it. I just got in the habit of typing in blogger.com up here in the Omnibox. Again, you might be hearing me call this the Omnibox. It's the search um, engine here for, um, it's where you search for the Google um, and Google Chrome web browser. Okay, so Mike says he sees it in his personal account, Lawful Perfect. Do you see it in your education account, anybody? So whether you do or not, you can always just come up here to the Omnibox and type it in. And um, again, what Blogger is, if you know, it's you know, to tell your story, whatever it may be, and you can see over here the different blogs I've started. I don't use Blogger uh, personally, but um, I've tried it out. And you can see Summer Draft, if I've um, published some, so if I look at um, this one here, this was embarking on my journey as um, an RETC, and I can, I've named it a title. I put, you know, a paragraph in here, put a picture. I can put a video in here. And then when I'm ready to publish, I can click publish there. So if I make any changes, I can hit save, preview, and then close, and then it brings me back to my home page for my blogger. If I have um, a blog, if I click up here and view blog, then I can see. So here's my blog um, that I have published out there. As you can see, I don't have anything on it, um, but you know, whether a student's using this or a teacher, it's just a place for you, know, you to share your story out there or share information. Um, I will show you some other blogs out there that um, people use because it's not always necessarily about writing. It could be about writing, but then you can put links out there as well. So just be aware of um, if you come over here, 
this is another thing with the blogger. You can publish it so anyone out there on the web can access it. Um, usually with students, again, you have to follow the policies of your school district, but people can um, put comments on there. Again, just like with your YouTube channel or um, some of your other things at you, your Google sites, you can have stats. So you can see how many people previewed it or looked at it. Um, again, you've got a lot of stats here. You can look at the traffic. Again, I don't personally use Blogger, um, but if you did and you wanted to keep track of you know, the stats, here's some stats here as well. Um, comments, again, you can see people can comment on your blog just like they can uh, your YouTube channel. And again, you can remove content, delete, or you know, let Google know that it is spam. If you see right here, what I noticed over the last few months, um, Google has been changing the interface of many of their apps. So um, it's saying in July, the new blogger interface will become the default. So I don't, I don't think this is the new user interface. Um, I don't know when it will. I know we're in July right now. Oh, but it says try the new blogger on the left-hand navigation. Okay, right down here. So they're very, you know, if you know one, you can um, hopefully easily pick up on the other one. I don't know which interface. I would assume um, it's the old interface still on exam two. So, but as you can see, it looks very similar to what I was just showing you. It's just set up a little bit different. Here's the draft, whereas before we saw the draft. So um, they're trying to finally come together and make their apps, um, the icons, very similar across the platform for all of the apps, which makes it easier, especially for um, the students and the teachers or anybody out there who um, might struggle with technology. So then when you have a blog, um, let me go back here. If I go to settings right here, this is another thing to be aware of, of where you can manipulate um, your blog. So again, right here, um, you would, if it has adult content, you would have to turn that on. Um, privacy, visible to search engines. Again, you have the um, ability to turn that on or off. And if you come down here, I'm not going to talk about all of this here in settings, but I am going to point out a few things. If I come over here to permissions, again, what's nice about Blogger is you can collaborate on it. I could have more than one author on a blog. So this way you could have, um, you know, students, again, collaborating on the um, assignment, on another conversation. Because again, with Blogger, you know, the kids will ask, okay, who's going to see my blog? If they know it's just the teacher, they might not work as hard. Um, if they know it could be published out there for other students to see or other students to collaborate on, they might put a little bit more effort in. So right here on this blog, it's showing I'm the admin because I'm the owner of it. And then um, I just added my personal account as a collaborator and it's showing then that person's in an author. If I wanna switch it over to admin, I can do that as well. You have control over that at any time. If I wanna stop sharing with this person, I can delete this um, person by clicking on the X. So I can save or cancel. Again, I can invite other authors if I would like to, invite more authors here. And then reader access here, if I click on that again, so do I want to give this access to the public, private to certain, just to the authors, or to any, to custom readers? Do I want to invite certain people to this blog? So again, um, you've got control over that. Reader access, or I'm sorry, I just went over that one. Custom readers, this is where I could invite people, but it's not letting me. All right, I'll need to look into that or maybe some pending customer reading invites. Invite more readers, okay. So right here, this is where I invite the readers. 
and I send them an email and then they have to accept it if they want uh, to be able to read the blog. So again, the big thing on the exam is they, um, if you look at challenge that I have for blogger here, you know, they're wanting you to maybe add a co-author or um, change some things in settings. So always try to find the settings on every app that you go into, and then that's where you can manipulate maybe some of the questions they're asking. Um, if not, maybe do a quick Google search to see if it can help you find where that um, information is at to change. So again, you've got um, control of the way it looks as well. You got control over comments and who can comment. You can post it using email if you want. You can get email notifications. So again, go through all of this. It's when you need to know it. I could, you know, stand here and talk to you about each thing, but it's, you're not going to remember it. You're going to be bored out of your mind. Um, so again, look through here. This is where you can manipulate who can see your blog and um, all of the different settings. So I don't know if you know, um, if you look at, if you follow Eric Kurtz. If you don't, he is a, a great resource. And I think I have his link in some of the material that we're doing today. I don't have it on here. I don't believe, no, but I, I know I have it in other places on this, um, in this slide deck. So Eric Kurtz, his website is Control Alt Achieve. You could spend, this could be PD for you for the next year. Uh, he has so much information out there. So you can see what was new um, in Google from May 2020. And then um, if you, you can see he's got all of these different tabs up here. And why do I talk about this now? Because he usually uses Blogger. And usually, okay, up there and you can see that it's the Blogger um, icon. So this was all created using Blogger. And what he's done here with Eric's resources is he's got it by topic. So if you want to learn more about Google Sites or any of these um, different topics, click on it. He's got a wealth of information. Um, again, what's nice about this when you need to know it, you can go there. So bookmark it, at, you know, do whatever you want. Um, but, you know, if you want, I. We won't get into Google Drawings today, but if you want to learn more about Google Drawings, if you click on Google Drawings, you can see here's some general information he shared. Here's drawings for graphic organizers, drawings for math. Go through there and most of the things he allows you um, to use the template and to use with your students as well. So if you're wintertime magnetic poetry, Again, if you're, you or your staff or um, the educators you're working with are doing magnetic poetry, that's worth um, taking a look at. Now, you know, if you're working with your staff, do you have to know about all of these things? Again, no. Sometimes direct them to the resources. When they need to know it, they can go there to look. Again, um, just like with Classroom and the different apps out there, you can archive different blogs as well. It, they don't delete them, but it just takes them off your page, so then you can see what you've done in the past if you don't want it on your page any longer. So then if you look at slide 39, got a challenge here for you um, to set up to practice setting up your own blog and following those steps there. And then I ask for you to, step five, share your blog address to your Google site. So do you want me to give you time to do this now or do you want me to just keep moving ahead to some of the other apps? Can I, for the people who are on screen with me, 
give me a thumbs up if I should keep moving on or, um, or a thumbs down if you want specific time. Okay. Yep. Or put it in chat. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right. So then again, here on slide 40, I put some fun different resources out there um, to learn about. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but before we move on, I put this in chat, but I guess you didn't see it. When you're creating the, uh, bl the blog post, it asks for a blogger profile. What does that mean? It, it gives you up to 200 characters, so it can't be just your name. Oh, your blogger profile? Good question. Um, like, I'm sort of stuck on that. I can't get past it because I don't know what the heck it is. Okay. Let's see. So when you first, when you first um, enabled your blogger, it's asking you to create your profile. So right. anybody else who just enabled your blogger profile, what did you put? Let me see if I can find, that's new blog. So it won't let you just put your name. It, does it want you to put maybe what well, you do? That's what I was doing. If it chose, create a new blog and, and follow this, the steps. Okay. So yeah, I would say put your name and then maybe put, you know, if you're an educator of teachers or educator of students, maybe put that as well. Yeah, great question, Lisa. Thanks for asking. And I, no, I didn't see it in chat. Did it let you go, Lisa? Uh, yeah, I did. Sorry, I'm, I'm just putting it in. I clicked finish and there we go. Okay. Yep. Thank you for asking because I'm sure other people might have had the same question. All right. Um, then here on slide 41 and 42, I know I covered this in the level one um, training as well. Just make sure you're aware of the search skills and Chrome basics. Um, I did put a couple more links in here about search operators and word order matters. And then uh, on slide 42 here, I, I put a link in here. It's from Eric Kurtz and um, it's the difference between apps, add-ons, and extensions. Make sure you, level one, you didn't really have to know too much about that. Um, level two, Again, whether you know it or not, maybe you can reference this during the exam to know the difference between those three um, out there. So um, again, it can be confusing for the new user and for the teacher, the new teachers out there using technology. So I always share this example, um, Eric Kurtz created. And you know, again, when you're working with um, other educators, show them that you didn't create everything that you're sharing with them. Or, or maybe you did, but um, again, I run out of time um, and realize that there's a vast amount of resources and information out there that's for free usually that you can share with them. So um, I was working with a, a teacher the other day, well, I guess during remote learning, and she had bought something off of Teachers Pay Teachers, and um, she couldn't share it with other teachers. She could put it with her students, but again, I'll, you know, if teachers are um, so used to using Teachers Pay Teachers, maybe you can show them all these other resources out there that, um, that are for free that they can share with others. So um, again, here's a difference between extensions, web apps, and add-ons. So again, know about that. If you have specific questions that I'm not covering, let me know. I'm not going too heavy into um, talking about Google Chrome because we did cover that in level one. But if you didn't take level one before um, and you're not for sure about some of this stuff, please ask whether it's in chat or you can stay on after and I can go over it more as well. Or if you feel comfortable, I've got time, we can, you can ask right now. Okay, um, the next thing is Google Earth. Um, again, this was another app the students love to go to. 
10, 12 years ago, um, using Google Earth in the classroom, the Google admin had to download it and had to give us permission. Now you can access it from the web. So all you have to do is come up here to a new tab and go to Google Earth. A um, couple neat features that they have. They've got some cameras that are live in different places of the world. And um, this one right here was um, live in Alaska that you could see brown bears um, feeding at, these, at this river here. Um, you could watch the river cam here and watch the bears live happening now. Kind of what this reminded me of um, was when, it, I know it was popular with my students a few years ago when they were showing, there was two different ones, the bald eagle and sitting in her um, nest with her eggs and then when they were born and when they were hatched and then she was feeding them. And then also trying to think, was, was there a giraffe in a zoo in Florida? Um, were the two things that I remember the kids loved watching and going to. Um, so I don't know if um, your students have experienced Google Earth or seen where people put up uh, live streams. Um, I think the giraffe and the bald eagles were live streamed maybe through YouTube, um, and then that was slowing, you know, slowing down the internet at the school. So anybody else have examples of your students going to different um, websites looking at videos that were live streaming, whether it was animals or street view? Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, Christy, glad we caught your daughter's attention. Maybe she can go check out Google Earth and see the live streams out there. Um, again, with Google Earth, we've got a menu bar. This shows you what um, each of the buttons are. One thing with Google Earth, um, you can import whoops, files um, and the files, sorry, my mouse. Um, you can import them as uh, KML or KMZ files. So just be aware that that's the type of files that um, supports here. Again, you can share and you can measure. So um, I'm going to jump into Google Earth, but before I do so, again, here on slide 44, this is yet another um, page here of different resources out there on Google Earth of how you might be able to incorporate it within your classroom. Again, you don't have to come up with lesson plans. There are some free resources out there. If you click on um, this uh, resources, I've got a link here to different resources that Google Earth provides. So this will kind of give you some ideas. Again, um, do you have to come up with all of these ideas? You don't. You know, share this out with your students and some of your students might say, oh, Mrs. Schwartz, I want to do, create a Google Earth for this project. Um, and it might be something that you didn't think about um, before. So um, again, there's a lot of information out there and um, it's hard to keep up with everything. So for example, on this, this, I always tried to, I felt like I didn't always reach the boys in my class. So anytime I could um, incorporate anything um, to do with sports to reach some of the boys. And yeah, it reached some of the girls as well. Um, but then I, I, I guess I just tried to vary um, different things. So if I look at this hitting home runs, this will um, bring up some, a lesson plan here about baseball. So again, did I create this? No, it's got information here, learning objectives. So already developed for me that you can use. You can even see the common core standards here. And then, um, you know, go through it. Yeah, it might take a little bit, but it's nice that it's already curated in one place for you. Then if I go back here, there's a, a worksheet to go along with this as well. So um, they can then go out um, and complete this here. And again, you can upload this to Google Classroom. So this alone has lots of different resources here that you could use right away with your students. So if I go to Google Earth, I can you know, type in Google Earth up there. If 
I click on this link here, it says download Google Earth, but you don't have to um, download it like um, an, an app on your desktop anymore. You can just then, once you go here, you can launch it. And then you've got the access to Google Earth. So this one's a little bit different than Maps that we looked at yesterday or even My Maps. And sometimes people think, well, I don't teach geography. I don't need to do this in my classroom. Well, you know, if you look back at the resources there, again, they've incorporated all kinds of different topics using Google Earth. So, let me, so then once I've got Google Earth, when I first, when it first loads, it just takes me to a random um, place. If I want to, come up here to search, just use the magnifying glass, and I can search a place. And what's nice about this, um, here's also, it gives you some featured in Google Earth. Sometimes, again, you don't have to create um, a new lesson. You could, you know, even have them choose something here in the featured um, in Google Earth as well. So in Mandela's footsteps, so they can start exploring if they're learning about Nelson Mandela. And what this is, this is the um, airplane feature. I forget what it exactly is called, but I can change that if I want it to go faster or slower. If I go up here to the menu, I've got settings here. So when I click on the three lines here, it brings up another menu. I've got some other features here. Um, so I can um, have photos shown on the map too. So I can see the various photos around. I can turn that on or off. If I go into settings, here's, um, I've got, it's called the turn on fly animation. So that it flies me to destination to um, around the world, wherever I choose. Um, again, if I don't like that, I can turn that off or I can turn that on. If I do have that on, then you have some other options here under settings. So I can have, the speed to go faster, what kind of um, animation do I want? So again, try the different ones to see what you, what you like. Um, show the zoom buttons. And you can control your memory cache size there. And then here's formats and units. If you click on here, you've got, whoops, the unit of measurement. Um, so if you, if it's coming up in feet and you need it to measure it in meters, you can change it right here or vice versa. Um, sometimes the kids, um, you know, maybe don't tell the kids um, that they can change that and then they can change it um, if they're, you're trying to teach them conversions and changing it from feet to meters. Okay, latitude, longitude formatting as well. So again, um, it depends on what you're using it for. You do have manipulation over these settings. Just make sure you hit save or that reset to your default if you make any changes. And what I like about this also, so it um, puts in, you know, the maps here. And I think I turned the photos on. So how did I get these little photos here? So if I click there, I can see different photos um, images or um, that they have placed here. How I turn those on, go back to the menu and I turned on the photos. If I don't want those photos on, turn those off and those go away. Um, again, another thing I like about this is it does give you information over here to the right and um, you'll see when we look at the Google Tour Builder that students can create um, some assignments similar to what we're seeing right now here in Google Earth. If I look down here, there's 10 different slides here of information. I can scroll through these and look at the different information here as well. Um, on the exam, as far as um, Google Earth, I don't have any um, challenges here. You just need to be knowledgeable about what Google Earth can do um, and that you can import the data and um, to Google Earth and Maps, so, but what kind of file types you need. Um, 
So it's a fun resource um, to um, learn about. Again, this was another um, tool that the students like to go to um, in their free time. And then, so when I saw that, oh, they were liking this, then um, I went out there to all of the Google resources and incorporated some assignments um, as I was learning about Google Earth myself. So again, it's all of these different tools can be overwhelming, um, but when you need to know it, you know that you can go back here to this slide deck for some of the links I have here and or just Google it and you will find a wealth of information. Um, another thing I wanna talk about on Google Earth here are the knowledge cards. So the Galapagos Islands here. So if any geography science teachers or you know, you could use this in any subject. You could come up with ways. Even literature, you know, you're incorporating writing, re researching. So here's the Galapagos Islands. If I want to see the photos on here, just click on the photos, then they'll start appearing. So then the students can explore and see more um, of, you know, up close of what it looks like from different angles. So. Doesn't that look pretty? So it looks like there's 21 photos out there that I can see. I can zoom in. Sometimes you can put the person down there as well to see like the street view that we're used to and maps. Um, this is in 3D. If you wanna change it to 2D, you can do that over here as well. Um, you can change um, you can fly to your location. You can also change um, to reset your compass here to swap out for the globe. Let me go back here. Another thing right up here, if you click on this, then you've also got um, some information about the Galapagos Islands here. I can add this to the project if I want. So I can create a project here in Google Earth. I can um, so the place title is Galapagos Islands. I can give it a name. So if I've got um, a project I've already started, I can put it on that. If not, I can put name a new project and give it a title. I'm just going to do sample. Is today, what is today's date? Is it the 22nd? Okay. And so then here I can create a project here that I'm learning about. And um, another way to curate materials. So then I've got the Galapagos Islands, a picture here, I here's my title, I can edit that. I can search to add a place, I can add a place mark, draw a line or shape if I need to, and also then put it in full screen. I can then also present this. If you look up here, you can also add collaborators. So uh, more than one student can be working on this at, at one time. Anybody use Google Earth out there and how you've used it? You wanna share how you've used it um, in your classroom? Okay, some people already did in chat, perfect. But if anybody wants to unmute, feel free. I haven't had time to read everything there. Um, so if I go to a different um, location here, again, as you can see, I can click on the different photos there. And then the photos, um, usually they do have um, here in the bottom left-hand corner of when it was taken and who took the photo. We um, used it in our geometry class inadvertently because we had a bunch of students, we were doing a pool project where they were supposed to design a pool that would fit in their yard. Okay. And a lot of the kids didn't know how big their yard actually was. And they were actually able to zoom in on their yard in Google Earth and measure it. Oh, perfect. So, and so we live in a rural community. So, you know, there was some of these kids have really big yards. Yeah. And, you know, so they couldn't, and they were like, we have no idea how big our yard is. 
and we inadvertently figured it out that one of the kids actually was like well here and we figured out how to do it on google earth with one of the students like it was and the kids got a kick out of it that they could zoom in on their own yard yeah, yeah. that's where i you know the kids always love checking out where they live or checking out where their friends live they think that's neat and sometimes depending on when the pictures were taken they can see people they know in the views i'm um, just like when i brought that up there was people on the beach so um yeah pretty amazing i get but scary sometimes at the same time that people can would, uh, i would sometimes use it as a writing assignment um, the little dice button that would just take you to a random location on the globe. I would have students um, on their computers just shuffle to somewhere on the globe and then use that location as either a location for their story or do a street view and write a story about that space. If they see people there, use those people as your actor or your characters in your story or whatever. Uh, some kids that have a hard time generating ideas really benefited from this because it gave them you know setting details that they weren't going to come up with on their own while also learning a little bit about other parts of the world okay perfect thank you mike for sharing and yeah just looking at this place that came up here on my screen look at those roads and could have a discussion of why the roads are built like that and not just straight up the mountain as well um, yeah there's so much so again, don't feel like um, you couldn't think of ideas to create this kind of like, I think it was Katrina who said, um, you know, her kids had the idea to let's just go to Google Earth and uh, measure our backyard. So, you know, give the students voice. Hopefully you can learn from them as well. And hopefully, again, you'll become comfortable about not knowing everything out there. Um, I know someone in chat um, put down you know, are there ideas out here for the younger students? Um, there are, again, you just have to look through here. Maybe um, I think there's a place you can even search or even just go out to um, Google search to see, but it looks like what there was fourth grade that I saw. And I was thinking I had seen um, some younger grades as well. Um, another thing here, do you guys remember Carmen San Diego? Well, they brought that back. Um, and they kind of kept it the, the kind of similar to what it looked like uh, when it was first released many years ago. I don't even know that when it was first released, but um, here's a classroom activity of how you can incorporate Carmen San Diego into your um, curriculum as well. So, um, you know, anything we're seeing, um, anything around, um, you know, tying it with a game or them getting you know, different badges or things when they complete uh, a project that um, has been helping increase um, the, um, the turn in rate um, of them completing the work. So thank you, Mike and Katrina and everyone else who shared their ideas, whether you unmuted or you shared them in the um, chat. I see Heather talked about the Google, um, tour builder and she created a lit trip with novels. Perfect. I'm glad she added that in there. Um, that brings us to slide 45 here about um, the tour builder. Um, it is currently still in beta. Beta means they haven't um, rolled it out 100% that it's, um, they're still testing it. So one day you may go into it and it may look different than it did the day before. So just uh, realize that. But what I'm finding, even if they put beta here, we're seeing that they can make changes at any time. So whether it's in beta or not, it may look different than what it looked like the day before. Um, so to go to Tour Builder, um, it's basically like what um, Heather said, um, storytelling. I don't know, Heather, if you feel comfortable unmuting or if you can and you wanna talk about it. Um, I mean, it's been a while, but I did it like with number of the stars and I just um, like took them around the world to the different locations that were talked about. And there was also a feature where you could actually go back in the past and actually see like the actual um, 
city or place during the actual time of the novel. Okay. Um, so I've also done it in history classes as well. Um, so you can kind of like go back and see the pyramids, like when they were actually made and things like that. Oh, perfect. Thanks for sharing. So to go into uh, Tour Builder then, I think you can just click on this link here. Let me close some of these links up here. Um, again, this was kind of, um, oh, help me out. Tour Builder, was it created? What was the history behind of why it was created? Maybe if you play this, it'll tell you. I remember at one time, but it just escaped me right now. Does anybody remember? Yeah, I think it, maybe it was when I saw it, watched that video or read it somewhere. But again, create, share, and collaborate your stories in 3D and Google Earth. So here it does um, redirect me to sign in. And since I've signed in before, it recognized me. I can go here to my tours. And I can, can see you your screen, Lisa. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. That's fine. You're not seeing my screen? No, we were seeing you right now. Oh, okay. Because right Actually, now it tells me you're seeing yeah, me. I was seeing yeah. your screen. It just turns it off. Whoever was watching, you need to click on um, view options and either do side by side mode or there was a, what's the other mode? Um, or just even exit full screen? No, it, it, it doesn't matter if it's full screen or not. Okay. I, I can see your screen now. Okay, perfect. Thank Thanks you. for saying. So as you can see with technology, there's glitches all the time, but yeah, if at any time, let me know. Um, okay. So tour builder here, you can create your tours. You can see some other tours out there. Um, you can see shared tours. Again, you can collaborate. Um, there's here a gallery. You can see other tours here in the gallery. And I was thinking that Tour Builder was originally created um, for the servicemen and women out there that someone wanted to track their journey. So, um, gosh. I need to find that out for sure because that's bothering me, but I'll find that out later. So again, this is another place. If you go to my tours or create new tour, um, students can be in charge of their own learning, whether it's a tour they're taking or like Heather said, maybe the um, tours, you know, the um, characters in a, in a novel of where they, um, their journey um, took them. So once you give it a name and then your author name here you could create the tour so um, if i go i can click on this one so it's um, you can't open this up in google drive you have to go to the app right now and here you can give it you know an introduction talk about your life maybe where you've lived um, if you've lived in different cities states or even different homes so um, here's where you can do that again you've got this drop down arrow it gives you the menu. Again, just make yourself familiar with the different um, options that you have. Again, on the exam, you don't have to, there, if you look back at the um, exam questions as far as the scenarios, there's no scenario with the tour builder. If I go back um, to this, this example here, this was about, I think, a service woman. Um, yeah, Elizabeth, her journey on um, being in the Air National Guard. So right here, it shows that there's 16 slides. I can click next and see different pictures. And then it's another way for them to journal, to write about their story. I can click here to see, go through um, and see everything um, she wrote as well. So again, I can zoom in or zoom out to see where it takes her. So again, play around with it. Be familiar with what the Google Tour Builder um, can do. Again, I put Eric Kurtz in here. He's got some ideas here how you can use Google Tour Builder for any subject. So again, remember this. 
convey it to your teachers too, that they don't have to remember everything. They could, even though, you know, Eric Kurtz put this, put, put this out, could you put this on the students, have the students look through it, and you learn as the students are learning this. Um, you can, but sometimes, you know, in education, we feel like we need to know it all. But I'm the first to admit, I don't know everything. I am learning so much still. So any questions about Google Earth and Google Tour Builder? Oh, Sharon, thank you. Put, um, she put it in chat that the Tour Builder was originally created, yeah, for the veterans out there. So thank you. Um, all right. So if you didn't know about much about Google Earth or Google Tour Builder before, do you think that's something you can share um, with your students and or your educators you work with? And you can um, hopefully increase the learning and give the students some more um, choice. Another thing out there, we've got the Google Expedition. Um, I use this in the classroom. I actually, um, Google came to my um, classroom. Um, they, we brought them into the area. Um, they came for two weeks and they brought the devices and um, let the kids experience this um, augmented reality and virtual reality using some expeditions that are already created. So um, if you go out here to the spreadsheet that I have here, um, again, this was someone created it, put it out there on the um, website with the expeditions that you can see all of the different expeditions out there that you can um, access. And again, what's nice about this was the kids um, used devices and it was in 3D. So again, this is, you know, talks about how we have surgeons out there doing heart surgery, looking at, you know, a 3D computer mod model of um, the heart if they're doing, you know, working on someone's heart. So it's not only in science, but it talks about how other ways we can use this. And, you know, it lets them, like someone said earlier, how we can't do field trips. This lets them take field trips to places that maybe they would never be able to go. And especially during this um, pandemic, won't be going, um, at least during the school year on a field trip. So feel free to click on this to um, look at this spreadsheet of different um, expeditions out there. If you go to this expedition article here, again, just talks about um, bringing your lessons to life. And, um, so when Google came in, they brought in the devices because my, all of my students didn't have their own device. But here, you know, perfect example, they got a dinosaur in the classroom. So um, it goes more in depth than that, but you know, that's sometimes to try to hook the kids into wanting to um, learn about this, but it just puts it a 3D model. So here's um, the base camp of, I don't, Mount Everest um, that they can, you know, go to virtually. Again, you don't need to come up with ideas. There's, as you can see, over 900 um, expeditions out there that you can um, access. And you don't necessarily have to have, you know, these goggles or um, was it called Google Cardboard or what was the original? Was that the, is that the name, Google Cardboard? Correct me if I'm wrong or if it's a different name or some of even the VR headsets. You don't have to always have those. Um, it gives them a, a different experience, but again, um, we, when Google came in, we just had devices that turned it in, um, you know, to, into 3D without using those. You can create your own virtual tour here using Tour Creator. Again, um, lots of tours out there that you don't have to create. So again, if you don't have time to learn more about this, again, put this out there, depending on the age of students you work with. Um, have your students look this up and help 
um, bring this to your classroom. So again, if you can you access it on a Chromebook, you can hear some requirements. So again, click on that if you need to um, learn about the requirements if it if you can access it on the Chromebook. And then again, here's creating the virtual tour, the tour creator that you could create your own. So again, can students create their own tour of maybe their house, their backyard, their um, subdivision or um, the corn fields or soybean fields, whatever they live around, um, they can do that as well. So again, just know about tour creator. All right, going through a lot here. Um, let's see what, any questions out there that I missed in chat or that someone wasn't able to answer in chat? Okay. All right, and just got a message. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Some people didn't have the correct link, so glad you were able to get the link and, and get in today. Um, my great question, I don't know. Um, I know during this um, pandemic, um, I don't know what they're, in chat, Mike asked, does Google still come to classrooms to do this? Um, I can reach out to, um, Nicole was the uh, person that came. I could reach out to her to see if they will after, you know, this pandemic's over. I don't know if we, if we go back to in face, if, um, if they will still come out here in the fall. But if you would like me to, I can um, check. I don't, I don't think I have her email, but I've got her um, phone number. So. If, if she does um, and she allows me to pass on her phone number to you, um, I will. So Mike, um, if I forget, let me, I'm gonna write it down here. If I forget, um, email me again, but hopefully if I can respond, you know, send her a text today that can, um, get a message back to see if they still do that. Cause yeah, it was nice to have someone else come in to do that. Um, especially with all of the equipment that she brought with her as well. All right. So what we'll do here, um, I'll go through a few more slides here and then we will take, I think we'll have time for a break here. Um, so we've got alternate forms of learning. Again, um, Google wants you to um, know about this, and many of you probably already do, especially during this um, remote learning that we have right now. Um, many teachers were forced to learn about this. So I've got some different links here. If you haven't heard these terms before, um, they do talk about these um, terms within the Google training site as well, but um, I've got some links here about the project-based learning. There's a website out there that um, you can go to to learn about project-based learning and maybe even get some resources that will help you um, within your school day. They've also blended learning. So what, what we're finding for some of the teachers who are using technology and has been using technology, the blended learning um, they were maybe already doing before remote learning. Basically, it's what some of you did um, do in remote learning. You, you know, took screencast or you recorded yourself. It's basically kind of um, sometimes like on demand that they can watch it when they need it, but then they come back to class and talk about it. So um, it's kind of hopefully where we are going to go as a society and education that if you think about when you need to learn something, where do you turn? Can you just go and Google it or ask Alexa or ask your phone? Um, and it's just like with this workshop today. Are you remembering everything I say or do you kind of zone out at times because 
you don't, it doesn't pertain to you at that time. And then you'll say, oh yeah, I remember she, you know, whether it was a teacher or myself talking about, you know, blended learning or whatever the topic was. And, oh, I really need to know that to do this assignment. So then they can go back in and look at a link to help them um, with, to finish the assignment. So there's an Illinois Blended Educators site as well. Um, so again, this is from Unit 5. Um, I thought this was interesting. Um, unit 5 is in Normal, Illinois. And so they've got a website out there that um, talks about blended learning. They tried to do this even before this pandemic hit. So um, be interesting to see how they've updated it um, since the pandemic hit or how they're going to go forward with it. Again, I've got a, a document here. You can get more information on the alternative forms of learning. So um, on, challenge, on this challenge here, I'm gonna keep moving forward if someone wants to do it on break or when you're prepping for the exam, that's fine. I just said, go back to Blogger and write a short review on one of the three, um, one of these three forms of learning and publish the blog and paste it back to your Google site. You don't have to do this on your Google site, but again, this is a challenge with a scenario to help you hopefully learn about Blogger a little bit more. Here on slide 48, I've got a video if you if you want to learn about the forms of learning. Again, this video I think is in the teacher center as well. Slide 49 here, um, I'm not going to read this to you. The different models, you know, if we're in the school setting, you know, boots on the ground, we know uh, that some different models um, that help. I know I have some coaches in here today. Coach might not be your title, but I think most of you are all coaches anyway, because not only are you working with students and you're coaching them in the classroom at times or, you know, daily, but then you're also being a coach to the parents during remote learning, helping them help their child um, through this process. Um, anytime I could get students involved in helping with the learning um, is always a bonus. It kind of um, gives them more of a purpose here. I don't know if you've heard of the tech Sherpas before, but this is where I think it's a high school. Um, this district has student led support. So they're a group of students who go help teachers go help students. Um, during the day, I would have teachers call me for computer help and support. Um, and sometimes I could help them right then and there. Uh, most of the time I couldn't because I had my own um, class of usually at least 30 students in the class. And so then I would try to. Um, coach the students of how then they could help some of these teachers. So whether they help the teachers um, when they were in their classroom for that hour for the subject or, um, you know, if I saw Johnny had time, you know, Mrs. Obert called, she needs help with her projector or whatever it may be. Um, I could send students out during class time to go help um, the teachers. I didn't have uh, you know, uh, own support group. It was just my homegrown one that I created with my students that I had in my class. And sometimes, you know, I asked the students who would like to help troubleshoot. And sometimes um, some of the students that I might not have called on went and helped. So don't forget about, you know, you're not in this alone. Have your students, whether the students are helping you or are helping other um, teachers or other students as well. So Again, just know the different models for teachers and for school. And then a big, I don't know if you've heard this now, with remote learning, a big, these two words, asynchronous and synchronous learning. Um, I've heard it in almost every workshop that I've attended. I've heard it on the news. Um, know the difference between the two of these. Again, um, you know, asynchronous is basically at their own time when they're ready. To learn it. Um, synchronous is all at one time. And we know synchronous learning with this remote learning, with having the kids in a work, you know, in a workshop, in a classroom, um, and teaching that way has not been working. Um, maybe it has for you. Maybe you can unmute, let us know how well it worked for you during remote learning. But majority of the educators that I work with and seeing my own kids um, do remote learning that 
they did not like the Google Meets. So um, feel free if anybody wants to speak on that, um, unmute yourself and speak, or you can put it there um, in the chat as well. Did remote learning just go awesome for everyone out there? I felt like Google Meets was a struggle for my students as well. Okay. Just because I had tech issues with sharing my screen and um, to get the grid uh, view to work, you had to download, you know, an extension and it, I, it was so glitchy and our district wouldn't approve us to use Zoom. And um, I didn't do a lot of my instructions through Google Meets. That was just more of an informal, like let's just socialize, and maybe do a Kahoot together, which was also okay. challenging. But um, I just found like screencasting and sharing videos was more successful with uh, my students learning from me than the meets were. Yeah, Melissa, thanks for sharing. What grade level students do you work with? Um, I have sixth graders. Okay, yeah. And that's been a lot of people saying with that. And, you know, as a teacher as well, sometimes I would think, oh, my district doesn't want me to use Zoom or things. At that time, um, there was questions about Zoom's um, security issues. So um, I think Zoom's worked on that, but again, it's, you know, going in lines with your district policy. Since then, hopefully, if, you know, when we go back here in the fall, if you have to use Google Meet, hopefully you will see some of um, how they've made it better and hopefully won't be as glitchy for you, so. Thanks so much, Melissa. Anybody else want to share? Yeah, um, this is Lisa. I've got a completely yeah. different perspective because I'm the librarian in my school. Okay. So I don't have classes per se, but um, just a little plug for all the school librarians out there. Assuming you have a librarian in your school or one accessible to you, absolutely positively make use of them. We are here to support you. So most of the teachers were so overwhelmed they forgot that I existed when you can't find um, a resource, if you have a kid who needs um, a special version of a book that you can't access and you don't know how to do it, if you need help, if you need someone to just, you know, read a book on, on video for you, reach out to your librarian. That's what we're here for. And oh. as, as overwhelmed as you are, you actually have more help than you realize if you, if you reach out. Well, good. Thank you for putting that plug in, Lisa. And frankly, I wish I could get my teachers to understand that too, because, you know, we like as many times I'd email, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. If people were so busy, they didn't take the two minutes to say, wait, what can she do that will actually save me, you know, two minutes on the front end, an hour on the back end. Yeah. If that oh, if you were in my district, I'd take advantage of you. Yeah. Well, good luck. So Hopefully. So just remember we're out there. There's a lot, you know, that's the whole point of the librarians is they're there to support you. Yeah, great. And that's, that's good that you have it. I know around here sometimes with budget cuts, um, I know in my previous district, the librarians, um, they were first to go or one of the first to go. So yeah, that, that's the fight in every state. Okay. So Lisa, you know, thanks for sharing that. And Melissa, also thanks for sharing your story. If you see in chat, some people said, yeah, same issues with their district as well. And again, you know, don't, um, to hopefully ease your work level, reach out to other teachers, your librarians, and reach out to the students. Again, it depends on the age level, but, um, you know, even those kindergarten first graders, they may know some things about tech that um, you could incorporate into your classroom as well. Um, I've got this resource here, Mind Flash here. Feel free, yep, click on that to learn more about um, the asynchronous versus synchronous learning here. And just like Melissa said that she did screencast of, um, you know, recordings of herself going over um, material out there, teaching sixth grade. Um, could have been, you know, lots of different subjects out there that she covered with the screencast. So they can go back and watch it when they need to. Um, another um, avenue you could use is a HyperDoc. Basically, it's just an interactive learning experience. Right here, it says this for students. Uh, you've got different links and resources there um, for them 
to access. So, and then it also helps you differentiate. Um, I'm going to jump in here to this hyperdoc down here that's um, a form uh, to learn Google Forms. So this is a hyperdoc to learn about Google Forms. Now, what I like about this hyperdoc, I didn't create it. For some reason, the names didn't appear on this one um, like they did on the, Google, on the Sheets ones. The same two people created this. So someone created the template and then um, from that template, Lisa Highfill um, created this hyperdoc here. It's an interactive, it helps you differentiate and you don't have to go and create several different assignments for your children, for your students. So for example, if I had, if I had to differentiate among some of my students and I knew um, I you know, wanted to challenge them, I would tell them maybe uh, to do more level threes than do all level ones. So if you see this color coded, the level ones should be, are set up as the easier um, activities um, as Lisa set forth. Now you may not think they're easy, so you have some discretion on what you wanna make level one, level two, and level three. So you could have the students decide, you know, tell them they need to pick something from each level and you know, talk to them about the color coding here. Or you can differentiate if you want um, to challenge some of your students more, or you know how you know, a student might learn better if they're watching videos rather than needing to read the work. So you have control. Will it take you time to build this up? It will. You could have your students help you build a hyperdoc on assignments. You know, here's material we need to cover or, um, and you know, get them in on this process. Work with other teachers if you've got, have that ability. Reach out to your librarian, like Lisa said, maybe, you know, if you have one, they can help as well. Um, and then also search the internet. There is, um, just like there's a Teachers Pay Teachers, help me out, there is a Teachers Give Teachers um, information out there. I know I can get it from Twitter. Um, if I Google it, you might be able to find it as well. But where teachers are um, sharing these resources for free, all they ask, remember don't, um, if you modify anything, and then you try to go and put it on Teachers Pay Teachers um, and say that you created it, then you know there's some copyright issues there. But for the most part, if you're going to reuse it in your classroom, you're free to use it how you would like. So just like this, you're free to use this um, if you would like to. Um, and that's why if you are creating anything out there and you are you know, sharing it with your teacher, sharing it out on the web. Make sure your name is on there. Um, I mean, can someone easily maybe recreate it and make it their own? They could, but um, I always like to give credit where credit's due. Um, if you look at the other example ideas for sheets, their names are there. So I don't know why their names um, didn't appear on this Google form. Maybe that was one of the first ones they put out and their names weren't there, but here's the um, other one that they have on. Google Sheets, right here it says the template designed by Genevieve, Hyperdoc by Lisa Highfill. So um, anybody wanna share about Hyperdocs or, or people are sharing in chat? Perfect. Okay. So um, again, if you look at this, if you look at this interactive map and drawings, so this was a map you can bring in um, images here in Google Drawings. And here on this Google Drawing, they hyperlinked each of the states to the, I think the history video. So um, yeah, click on the outline of the state to watch the History Channel episode of that state. So if they wanna learn about, let's go here and click on um, Alaska. So if they wanna learn about Alaska, they clicked on this line, it, it's hyperlinked here to um, a video of Alaska then from the History Channel. So you can you know, create a hyperdoc. Um, it doesn't even have to be on um, 
a, a Google Doc. As you can see, it was a hyper map. Um, and this slide deck, it's like a hyper slide deck because there's links in here throughout that you can click on um, to get more information about that topic. All right, here on slide, or anybody want to say anything about HyperDocs or have any good HyperDocs out there you want to share with the group? Um, I know Angela and chat put down that um, website for the HyperDoc one. Perfect. I don't know if I have that linked here on this slide anywhere. I did see a HyperDoc um, during e-learning last spring that said it was like Texas Landmark. And then they researched about Texas landmarks, and then at the end they did use. Oh, Sarah, I can barely hear you. I'm sorry. Is that better? A little bit. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's my mine. I don't know. Try it again. Type it out in the chat. Okay. Yeah, you were strong there for a bit, and then yeah, you got quieter. So she, I think I heard her. She's going to put it in chat. So thank you, Sarah, but um, if you can get your mic working, yeah, love to hear your voice. Um, so Angela put this, um, the teachers give teachers information. Um, and then again, there's information out here about HyperDocs. So great website, um, just need to take time to go and learn about it. So I have this HyperDocs um, link here as well. They've got some classes and courses you can take. There's a, a subscription. Um, so it's the same website that um, Angela put out there. It just, it, it brings you to a different page. So feel free to take a look at that. I'm gonna close out of it because it's taken a while to load. All right, and then the last two things that we're gonna talk about before break here is Google Scholar and Google Books. Um, Google Scholar, I've just used mainly with older students, but again, um, know that it's out there. And I've got my red squiggly line there. I'm seeing, okay. Should I only have it say sources instead of resources? All right. I don't like that red squiggly line there, so I'll put that right there for now. Um, but again, just to know about it. I know some of the teachers I was working with, they said, oh, they wish they would have known about Google Scholar as they were working on their thesis for their master's or doctorate or in college, no matter what. So Google Scholar, um, you can click on that link there I have in the slide deck. I also, you can go to scholar.google.com as well. And, um, you know, I just got a message. Is Heather here today? She's asking for the Zoom link as well. Well, excuse me for a second. Um, oh, you're here? Okay, perfect. I just saw this message pop up. I don't know how long ago you were asking for that. My apologies. Um, so going back here to Google Scholar then. Um, so you can search for articles. You can search for case law. Um, once you search, let's say you want to search for um, digital citizenship. And if I'm searching here within Google Scholar, it will give me some um, information on digital citizenship. And, you know, if I'm doing a, my thesis or needing to find some information on it, I can see right here it's a PDF. It shows me um, how many results I have. And then what else I can do when I search Right now I put any time. If there's a specific time period I need to search, come over here and click any time or click on what I want or I could do a custom range. So if I want to just see the research out there since 2020, here's all of the information out there on digital citizenship um, and education when I put those three keywords in. Do you see how it pulls up di digital citizenship? Um, if I put it in quotes, what will happen? So see how it pulls up digital citizenship. It pulls up education here. It kind of highlights the three words. When I put it in quotes, whoops, I didn't put it in quotes. Then it tries to find um, those three words together. 
In this case, it didn't. Um, it just it stopped highlighting, but um, right here in the description of it, it finds here's it talks about digital citizenship education. So if you want to try to find those three words together, put it in quotes, um, and then you can see that. So let's say I want information from here. What I can do, I can click on it. It um, opens up the information, the PDF file of it. And say I, I look at it and I like it. Then what I can do, I'm gonna go ahead and just hit the back button. I can star it. So starring it kind of like saves it to my library without me doing anything. If I need to, here's quotes. I can um, get the citation of this article right here. And it gives me it in five different um, citation views. So depending on uh, what citation view I need for the, um, for the class, I can choose whatever I need. Hopefully it's at least one of those five. And then I also have these double arrows here that I can view it as an HTML if I want. Um, I haven't used that before. So if I want a custom range, so that search since 2020, but if I want a custom range, I can put whatever custom range I wanna find. Usually for some of the research papers, they ask for the last five years of research out there, or they may even ask the last three years. You can put whatever custom range you want here, and then it will search those years for you. So even though it put 2020 here and I put 2017, it just rearranged it for me, okay? I can sort by relevance, I can sort it by date if I wanted to. Here, it includes patents, it includes citations, okay? So when I star that, where did that go? It went up here to my library. Do you see the star? And when I click on my library, then I can, when I click on my library, Here's all of the articles I have in my library then. It's showing all articles in your library on digital citizenship education. So it's like a bookmark feature, it saves it for you instead of you needing to go outside um, of Google Scholar and bookmark it. It bookmarks it for you within Google Scholar. Um, if you go here to my profile, this just shows your profile here. You can add more to it if you would like. I don't think I've really changed it much. Lisa, then, yeah. Heather, Heather has a good question in the chat about, is, is there a way to search for articles that um, are free? Like, can you refine your search results so that you're not, so that students don't get um, redirected to sites where the full article isn't available? Yeah, good question. Since we have a librarian, librarian on, Lisa, I don't know if you're with us right now. I'm here. Okay. Did you hear the question? Is there a way? I did, and frankly, this is why I've been avoiding this site for years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, let, me go, let me log on to it again. I don't know, and I've ran into that same problem that in the classroom, I didn't I showed the kids about Google Scholar, but for that reason, I didn't, um, that wasn't our see. primary go-to. I don't know if an advanced search, like, a, a, I don't know if anyone of, any one of you have ever done a Google advanced search, but there might be a way to search Google Scholar, let me see. Um, okay. Region last well, she's week. looking it up. I was thinking, I don't know if it, if I put plus free, right? But I'm thinking it's going to, yeah, it's looking for the word free. So I haven't figured it out. So hopefully maybe Lisa, if she figures something out, she can share that with us. Um, she's also talking advanced. I don't think you can do an advanced search within Google Scholar like you can. Oh, of course you can. Scholar .google, if you do site or domain, scholar.google.com, and then you do your search, of course. <laughs> Walk us through that again, Lisa. Okay. Um, if, if, ever, if everyone wants to go on to Google.com do you want to advanced your search. Hmm? Do you want to share, your, do you sure. want to share your screen? Do, you, do I have permission? You sh should. If you don't, let okay. me know. Okay. Here we go. 
Okay, so I'm on advanced search. The way you get there, you can literally just Google advanced search or google.com slash advanced uh, underscore search. So there's actually a place on here to narrow your results to, to look only within a site or domain. So if you see over here, site or domain, if I put scholar.google.com, I believe that's the correct site name. Yeah, so, I think so one way to limit it is if I say I only want something that is a file type PDF. I'm, I'm playing with this to see if this works. Yeah, that's so fine. Now if I do this, the search, let's say I'm looking for um, um, earlier start high school. Most of my kids love that search, but I don't see anything. So let's see site scholar.google i don't know is it scholar.google.com yeah is the question so yeah. it might it might not work but there is a way like when you want to do an advanced search if you're searching through google you can tell it um as you're doing your search your search to only search a specific site so if i only want to search through scholar.google then i should be able to Yeah. Okay. That, then that's not working. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks for trying. And um, but if you play, if if I don't know if anyone knows about the advanced search, but if you play around with it, I know um, that's always one of the favorites of my high school kids. Let me go back there. Um, one of the great things is you can actually tell it what information you don't want. So you can say over here it says none of these words. So when you're searching, like if you want to find out about the Miami Dolphins, you want to find out about the dolphin swimming in the ocean, you can say, I want to find out about dolphins, but I don't want football. And now when you search, you will not find out anything about the Miami Dolphins football team. Did I lose you? Oh, you're good. Thank okay. you. Okay. So that's just, I mean, honestly, that's one of the, that's one of the fan favorites for my kids. Um, otherwise, if you There's go- There's an advanced search in the Scholar. It's in the upper left-hand corner with the three little side, like, bars oh. in the upper left-hand screen. You just click on it, and then you click on advanced search. So you're saying, where is it? So click there, and then down, it says advanced search. Advanced right there. search, there we go. Okay, so it's allowing you exactly what I just said. You can have with the exact phrase with at least one of these words, um, with, without the words, anywhere in the article, but it's not, it doesn't seem to be letting you find something for free. And it, it doesn't really say on it specifically paid. So I don't know that you can say free and it will call that. Yeah. Which is honestly why I really, tell my my high school kids don't even bother okay that's good to know but yeah just know and about for, it for the exam. yeah for college it, it, when you're at the university level it's great because like like uh who was it heather said you can go to your i mean sorry melissa you can go to your uh, uh university librarian and they can get the article for you at okay. the high school level i don't have that power oh you don't have that power why not lisa <laughs> shocking but you know we i don't have access to all the university libraries Sad, but true. Yeah. Although, you know, it's a little secret. I've got two kids in college, so I sort of use their credentials sometimes for myself. Okay. <laughs> but that's another story. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for sharing, Lisa. Uh, great conversation here. So as Lisa pointed out. Let me unshare if I can. The question is, where am, where am I going to Just at the to top unshare? of your screen where it says stop. Sharing. There we go. Yeah. So perfect. You learned something new about sharing the screen. Um, and so great question. It doesn't look like that you can, um, just filter out the free, but again, just be aware of Google Scholar, how to search and then how to do a custom range, um, on Google Scholar. So let me share my screen back here. And then, um, what Lisa was talking about that advanced search. So you can type in google.com advanced search or Another place you can go once you're, you know, if you do type in digital citizenship, 
this is just right regular back in the Chrome web browser. Um, so if I type in digital citizenship here, um, here's if you go under settings, here's where you can do advanced search. Um, you can look at your search settings, search activity. So you've got some other tools there. Um, so if you need me, you know, have questions about that, feel free to play around with that and ask in chat. But that's another way, but I liked how Lisa did it, that you can just put it in the um, Omnibox and um, it brings up this, the advanced search that way as well. Um, Sarah's putting out there, um, what about without words paid subscription? Might work, try it, let us know. If anybody wants to try that, let us know if that works or not. But um, just know that that's another option out there uh, for Google Scholar. Another thing, or um, anything else about Google Scholar? Any other questions right now? I know, still trying to figure out a way if we can find search on Google Scholar, um, finding the free articles. Um, another thing, Google Books is out there. When I first learned about Google Books, I thought, man, this is a great way that I can put this in my classroom um, and have when the you know kids had free time, they could go and read some of their Google Books. Kind of like how Lisa avoids Google Scholar, I've learned to avoid Google Books because it seemed like all of the books I was running into weren't free. Um, so if I wanted to um, look at, let's say my students were reading The Giver, and this just you know looks up Google Books. If you see I'm in Google Books, I don't know if anybody noticed when I'm in um, just the regular Google Chrome over here, I can look at books right here as well. That brings up a tab. Um, it brings up books that on digital citizenship, but if you look, um, it's searched in books, but this one's, there's no preview to it. This one does have a cost. So if I wanna get the book, I have to pay for it. Um, but when I was searching The Giver, I found a copy of The Giver that I didn't have to pay for. So there's some books out there, I don't know how um, they decide um, what books, are free. This one, this one, oh, this one's showing me it, it. I can't see it all. I did the search earlier and I could see and read the whole entire book from here. So I don't know if I had a free preview trial sometime or if I just chose the wrong book this time. If it, there's different versions out there that I might have access to or not. But again, with Google Books, a great resource. Um, but what I have found, um, if you wanted to read the book from here, it cost. So it's, it's not what I thought it was in the beginning. Um, so Lisa posted in chat, okay, there's a, another collection of library that all of the books in that collection are free. So perfect. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so here, the purpose of Google Books, you can search different books that they need to look up, you know, do a preview of it to see if you're doing, a, what do you call those when you introduce a book? Like a, they do a, oh, some teachers have a name for it and that, that it just escaped me. A book talk, thank you, Mike. Um, if they, you know, introduce different books out there to see what books the students want to um, do next, here's another way they could look it up as well. Um, here I've got a preview of 28 pages if you need to see any research on it or you know get a citation you can look to see who the author is whatever you need to see um, about it they can learn about the author this way as well so anybody use Google Books and how you use it in your classroom or in your life Constanza is asking, um, is audio included as an option in Google Books? Good question. I don't know that answer. Has anybody used the audio feature or does Google Books have an audio feature? Maybe we can look, look that up here. Um, also here with Google Books, you've got your advanced search right here. So just like um, with, with 
Google Scholar. It did have an advanced search, but it was here under the menu. This one with Google Books, it was right there in the search box. Um, so that's why sometimes I do get confused. Um, sometimes they throw the advanced search right there. That's why I was thinking Scholar didn't have it, but they put it under the menu. Um, I've also got, um, I can go and see my library. So I can put down, I can keep track of the books I wanna read. I can keep track of the books that I've read. So you can get your own library. You can have a new shelf here of your, you know, favorite books you have, whatever it may be. So just know about this. Um, so maybe go to Google Play now to get, I don't know if I can get audio through there. And then know about the, the gear here. You know, you can send feedback or report an issue, but there's really not um, any settings that you can change on this page. So if you look um, on this HyperDoc challenge here, we're going to, um, I've got some steps here about creating a HyperDoc. Again, um, this scenario will help you on the exam and give you practice. Um, do you have to do this right now? You don't because trying to run through this, um, I'm going to give you a break here as well. So thank you for those that have been staying um, here with me, but hopefully those that needed breaks took breaks whenever. Um, so again, you might wanna flag slide 53 um, to look at it. You can go through it right now if you would like. Um, if not, we will take, um, we'll take a 10 minute break here. And if you wanna stay on and talk to each other, that's fine, you can unmute yourself um, as well. So at 10.51, um, I'll start going here and we'll talk about Google Sheets, but on break, feel free if you wanna look at some of these sites as well, um, but I'll be back at 10.51. All right, so here on slide 55, we've got some information on Google Sheets. Um, you didn't need to know about Google Sheets on the level one. Um, on the level two, they just look at some other um, options for you to learn about here, and we'll jump into a, a Google Sheet to learn about that. If you've um, never checked out uh, Flippity, um, check Flippity out. Um, it is another resource some, I think it's add-ons, I say that, and now I'm second guessing myself, uh, flippity.net that you can easily turn your spreadsheets into um, flashcards, or I, I think there's several different ways you can um, turn your Google Sheet um, into other things. So if you look right here, um, this image I have here, these are some different add-ons that you can do. Some add-ons, um, the most recent one is um, you can turn in a Google um, Sheet, you can save it as a doc, you can remove duplicates. So what I use that for in a Google Sheet is that when I have, um, if I have duplicates, if I have you guys joining me for different sessions and I wanna email you guys out, I'll click on remove duplicates so you don't get several emails from me from the sign-in sheet. Um, as you can see, there's some other ones here. Sometimes the add-ons, um, you might have to um, update. If they're not working correctly, you might have to uninstall them. Um, again, with your school account, if you don't see add-ons, is because you don't have access to do um, to add-on. So check your personal account for that. And then um, we're going to talk about pivot tables here as well. So. Again, if you wanna learn about pivot tables, I put some great resources in here, links, that when you're ready to learn about it, or right before the exam, you can reference them. But basically, um, a pivot table allows you to analyze data in another way. You know, if you're looking at hundreds of students, test scores, um, or whatever data you're looking at, and it, it's just not um, a few students, it's hundreds of students, Again, a pivot table will allow you to analyze it so much better. So we will jump into that and um, go over that. Some of you, if you want to go into this beginner's guide, 
Ben Collins, um, a resource out there that I came across. He's got step-by-step -step instructions on how to do um, a pivot table if you want to know. Um, you know, step by step, you can see this if you're trying to teach this to other people. Why not use this resource? Why recreate the wheel? If you look at his um, site, he's got other tips out there. Because again, I no matter if it's a level one or level two exam, Google Sheets is the one that causes, this app causes um, many educators out there stress because they don't use it all of the time. Um, they haven't had to. So this way, this will hopefully um, broaden your horizons on, on Google Sheets. And that's what we'll talk about here today um, are the pivot tables. So, but again, you have this link here you can reference later on. Um, if you're like me, it took me more than just one time um, learning about pivot tables. And some of you guys aren't auditory learners. So when I show you this here in a little bit, um, it might not make sense. You might have to go through that step by step to understand it. So um, I put an example in here. This was uh, the example that Ben Collins shared out. Um, it let me make a copy, so it's showing me I am the owner of it. I didn't create it though. Um, as you can see, Ben Collins created it. Let me go to um, the sheet here. And what's nice about this, so here, um, what he, what Ben created was the property type of, um, he, or he put property types here, whether it's an apartment or condo or house or townhouse. So he's got four different. So we've got this data here. This is great, especially if you're um, looking for a place to buy. If I come up here, many of you know how you can sort it. So I could put all of the apartments together, condos together. Um, oops, it brought in the, the header there here. Um, and then townhouses. So I could do it this way. Another way to do this is the pivot table to analyze this data. So I can go up here to data and go to pivot table. And it's saying, hey, do I want to um, create a pivot table using this sheet one and then A1 to B17? I do. Let me, okay. I just undid my sort there because it had the headers within there. So I can put it on a new sheet or I could even put it on this existing sheet. I'll go ahead and put it on a new sheet and hit create. Now, what's awesome about this, if you've never used pivot tables before, Google is suggesting, hey, do you want to create a pivot table of the average sales or the sum of sales price? So if you want to um, create a, a pivot table of average of sale price, I can just click on it and it will create it for me. So voila, it did the average sales of um, the different types of um, properties out there that are for sale. So I can see if I wanna spend the least amount of money, maybe check out an apartment. Um, but, and then you can see it, here's the average of, of the sales, but it's based off of the average. So right over here, it did it for me. It said the property type, um, it put it, I added it in a row, but it did it for me. I didn't have to do it. So it put the property type in the rows. And then in the columns, it put the sales price. If I don't want the sales price, I can X out of it and I can go and click what I want in that um, column. Um, since in this case, I'm only looking at two um, columns here. The only other column is the sales price. So it puts that data in a pivot table for me to analyze it. Could I analyze it here back in the sheet? Could I go ahead and um, you know, do a formula for average price for apartments, average price for condos? I could, but that's a lot more work um, and formulas you have to do. So if you just go to data and create a pivot table, you can then analyze the, um, the data in a different way. And it's with a few clicks of the button. You don't have to go and um, you know, do all of that work of creating the formulas here. So if I go to, um, let's see, I think I have another sample spreadsheet here that I'm going to um, go over, but I've got it here in the challenge too. But if I click on the sample spreadsheet here, it should force you to make a copy when you open it. 
you can open it now if you want or you can wait and open it later. So just like with the level one exam, you had to um, you know, put formulas in. So I can put a formula in here. And again, there's multiple ways to put the formula in. I can, I'll just go ahead and highlight that and go ahead and put the formula there. And then I can drag it down if I want. So here, if I want the word pass or fail to come up here so that I don't have to, um, it's just another way that I can see the data real quick that I don't have to look at all of the numbers. I can put a, a formula in here. If I use the, um, what is that formula called? The, the count if function. And again, you don't have to memorize this or anything, but just know that you know there's other formulas out there. I think I can even come up here and click on the count if function. I just have it memorized of what, um, that's not what I want though. It's up there somewhere. I'm just going to go ahead, it's equals if. And then let's say I want, um, it's J2 is the average. So I put the parentheses J2, and you don't have to do it this way. I could have went to the explore function to find the, the formula that I want. And I want it to J2 to be um, greater than 40. So if it's greater than 40, let's say it's pass. And then I put quotes there and I'll say pass, quotes. So if it's greater than 40, I want it to put the word pass in this, set, in this cell. If it's not greater than 40, then I want them to put the word fail in this. So then what's going to happen? I've got the word pass, it shows pass. So if I, again, use my fill handle and drag it down, it's going to go ahead and put pass or fail there. So here's yet another way I can look at the data and bring it to my attention. Now, if you see the conditional formatting right here I've got is it's all green. How did I even get that conditional formatting? So let me go over that as well. If I go up here to format and I go to conditional formatting, the conditional format rule I had here is if the cell is not empty. Okay, well, I don't want that. So I can just easily hit this trash can and delete it. So then it takes the color away. So if I hit add a rule, what it's going to do, I need to apply a range. So if I know that this is going to be K2 um, colon, I can highlight it or type it in over here. Let me just go ahead and go to K30. If I come down here, Right now, um, it's got all green. If I put format cell is not empty, if I click on that, I want it to say if the text contains, and then put a value or formula here, if it contains pass, I want it to be this color. So did you see immediately, it took off a color here for fail. Do I want that color? I can keep that color if I want, or I can change it. I'll just go ahead and keep that. Now, if I wanna add another rule here, I can have multiple rules within the same spreadsheet. I've got it K2 to K30. Text contains, let me put the word fail. And then let me change the color. And then, so it changed it to this light pink color, whatever color that is. Um, and then hit done. And so right here, it shows that I have two conditional format rules for this spreadsheet. So it's letting me know, hey, it's K2 to K30. So if I use a fill handle and go all the way down, it's going to say fail right now. Why is that? Because it's pulling from the formula, is pulling from the J14. If it's less than 40, it's going to say fail. So then what happens here, if I use the fill handle here and go down, it changes based off of what the figure, the value here is here in column J. So um, just going over conditional formatting, how do you do that? You go up here to format and go down to conditional formatting. The big key here is making sure you apply the range of what you want it in. Anytime you want it, 
from beginning to end, you need to make sure you have the um, colon there. You could also highlight what you want to be in the range as well. And it pulls it over here then. And then when you create your rule, you've got all of these different options here. And so when I, on the spreadsheet that you filled out when you signed in, I don't know if I have that pulled up here, that I created the conditional formatting here real quick so then I could see um, the people in the workshop. I didn't have time to read everything, but it brought my attention to the color. Okay, I've got a lot of people in here who solid, solid with the, some Google tools. There's some people, newbies. So it kind of helped me um, judge what to spend more time with when I'm in um, different workshops talking about the different Google tools. So again, um, I've got not only the data here, but then that the color, it helped me, like I just said, identify um, without me reading everything that's in the cells. Could I have applied more conditional formatting to this? I could have. Um, go back to format, conditional formatting. So I have two, but I could have put down um, another conditional formatting of if it had the word I'm comfortable or let me teach the workshop because um, again I try to incorporate um, some of those participants to give them time to share to unmute themselves to share information as well. The um, if you know again don't panic if you're not good with formulas you can come up here and find um, different formulas. Just for this worksheet only did I want to show you this pass fail and the if uh, formula there. So again, it's up, it's up here somewhere. If someone, it's, if someone wants to find it, if you find it, let me know. Um, but I've just gotten used to knowing what the formula is. So that's why I just typed it in. So with Google Sheets then, um, if you want to take time, whether it's later today or in the future, to go over this challenge here, I kind of walked you through some of it. Um, and then have another sample spreadsheet here if you would like to create a pivot table and and practice on your own as well. Mike, are you answering all the questions over there in chat? Or do you want to unmute? Do you need to talk about any of them? I, I was just asking if, um, forms like information from forms can um, upload to sheet and he answered that okay perfect thanks do you want mike to show you how that they upload to sheets or do you know melissa i don't know um i don't mind being shown if other people want that as well perfect and mike i don't mean to put you on the spot do you want to take over on the screen and share yeah that's fine that's no problem let me because that. that'll be a great lead in then to talking about um, forms for a little bit as well. Um, I'd put together our back to school survey, which, as you see here, we actually had great response 492. Um, but why I pump this into sheets is if we look at responses without going into a lot of detail, our first question dealt with, is we've got two buildings in our district, um, but and we wanted input from parents and guardians of each building. Well, in some situations, parents had kids in both buildings. Um, and so when you look at our responses here, you, you know, you see it's, it's, it's pretty close to split down the middle. Red is elementary parents only, blue is high school, junior high parents only, and of course the, the orange is both. So when looking at the data, the way I put the survey together was once you answered the first question, it sent you down a channel. All the questions were the same, but I wanted to pull data for junior high, high school parents separate from elementary parents. 
one of the questions we had on there was about transportation. Well, as you see, a lot of high school kids drive, so of course they're going to be, you know, heavy on the no in transportation, whereas elementary students, you know, it's not as heavy and even more so over here um, with what's going on there. So what I needed to do that Google Forms could not do was all this 102 parents and guardians that have kids in each building. To be fair, their information needed to be counted twice. And so we needed, um, we needed their answers to fall under the elementary and under the high school um, because they have kids in each building. And so by doing that on its own, Google Sheets or Google Forms, I'm sorry, keeps everything separated. And what I did um, was put together a spreadsheet. Give me a second here. Yeah, I put together a spreadsheet where I went back through um, and added, as I said here, including students at both schools. So I went and pulled the 102 answers and added each of their categories into where it needed to go in the answers so that when administration looks at this and their decision-making process, they know that everybody's answers are in line with the school that their students attend. So I didn't use a pivot table, but I did use um, the insert chart function, which is, I mean, Google does a great job of you put your information in and it, you don't even have to highlight where you want the information to come from. I typed in this question and the answers and hit make chart and it made a chart. And so, um, but yeah, I used the, um, I used the back to school information. Now to do what, what you can do, and this is how you set up your answers, is you've got this view responses and sheet function up here in your responses. You can also um, download the responses and it puts in a CSV file, which is a spreadsheet file anyway. But if I were to click that link alone, it sends it all over here in, um, in this very, <laughs> very detailed you know and and because it's every individual answer that we got the timestamp, etc cetera, etc cetera. so i could have gone through all of this data here and made pivot tables and conditional charts etc cetera, etc cetera. but honestly for me it was a lot easier to just pull the answers out of the forms and then just add them um to this to this spreadsheet perfect yeah so again, it allows for differentiation. Um, I'm glad you shared this with us, Mike. Yep, yeah, no problem. Yeah, perfect, thanks. And great question, Melissa, here. So that's why when I showed you on my, I'll switch back here, on my screen when I had up the spreadsheet, I think I shared with you yesterday and today, that was me going on the Google form and what Mike just showed you, clicking on that green spreadsheet it took it all right there, um, information into the spreadsheet for me. So it's just another way to look at data, another uh, differentiation tool if you wanna put that all in um, a spreadsheet. So yeah, great um, resource. And I try to have it, I'm not trying to show your names or emails over there if you don't want it shown. So that's why I'm just showing this part of, of that. And this was the sign-in sheet that you filled out. And then today, what I allowed you to do um, was that I didn't make this required these this um, la the last two questions so that if you didn't want to answer it again today you didn't have to okay so hopefully the people who feel like they can teach the workshop hopefully you've been um, unmuting yourself and um, helping out here if I missed um, you if you still feel comfortable in this last part um, please jump in as well so all right so thanks again mike and um, here's some challenges here whether you've got time today or um, whenever you get ready for your exam we may have time here at the end as well for you to work on it so um, google docs forms and sheets challenge another challenge here if you're not um, familiar with Google Forms. I wasn't going to go in too much in depth with forms, 
but if I go to my drive and I want to pull up a form that I know. So if I search my drive here, click that down arrow, I'm going to go and search forms and I want to search a form that's owned by me. So here's yet another way um, to search. And here is a, a form that um, created. And one thing with Google Forms, if you're new to Google Forms, make sure on every form you put down um, what is their name. Because if you don't ask for their name, it, um, you don't have their name. You could make it required by asking for their email address and that's fine, but some school districts email addresses doesn't have the child's name in it. So um, what I've learned, make sure you put your name. Another thing I learned, and I, would, I might say, what is your name and ask for the kids to put their name? Well, kids might just put their first name. So I learned to ask two separate questions. What's your first name and what is your last name? And I would always make those required. So to, um, do a, to add a question here, all you have to do is come up here and hit the plus sign and you can add a question. Um, whether it's a new form that you're starting now or if it's one you've already created. Um, again, if you've got a question here, you can choose what type of question you would like. You've got all of these different um, answers here. And they also have um, artificial intelligence turned on and maybe someone else has experienced this. But let's say I put in, what is the capital of Illinois? Then I'll get options for answers down here. But sometimes that shows up for me and sometimes it doesn't. Um, anybody else experienced that? Someone says it's maybe based off of the Wi-Fi you're on. Well, I've tried that and that's not, um, I don't think that theory holds true to that. But if anybody else has experienced that with Google Forms, let me know that um, sometimes, so Mike put in there, what day is it? It will generate the days of the week. Um, and again, sometimes that will work for me and sometimes it won't. So here, thank you, Mike, it's working right now. It's showing me some suggestions here. So if I want to add all, I just click on add all and it will um, add all for me. Um, so again, sometimes if you don't see it, I don't know the reason why you want to see it. If you want to try it right now to see if you see it on your screen, Maybe Mike just knows the exact questions that it always will add the um, options there. So then if I hit add all, I've got all of the choices there. So if I want multiple choice, I can't. If I want this a checkbox, you know, if I ask the teachers, what day is best for you to do, you know, PD or learn about something, they can check the boxes that they want. Or if I want them to only choose one, you know, um, I can put that there to choose one and set it up multiple choice if they can only choose one. So you've got some choices here. Um, I'm going to um, show you also import questions. So if you're using Google Forms a lot, if you hit import questions, you can import questions from previous forms. So um, it brings up all of your previous forms here that you can um, click on a, a previous form, select it. And then over here on the right hand side, it brings up, here's the questions from that form. So if I want to put all in, what is your name, first name, last name, I can import those two questions. So I don't have to retype it every time. And it's with a click of a button. Then when I hit import questions, those questions will appear over here. I'm going to go ahead and delete this right now. Um, you've got where you can add title and description if this is, you want, if you want this to be a new, under a new title, you can add images, add videos, you can even add sections. So, um, you know, make sure you are familiar with forms and how to um, add questions and sections. Um, what a section does, I don't know if I have a section. Yep, I've got a section here. Um, what a section does, it just breaks it down. So when the uh, students or teachers are filling out the form, they don't see all of the questions at one time. They um, see it section by section. Uh, as you can see, when you do a new section, it creates a title. So some teachers might put all their multiple choice under one section. Um, 
if they have you know other types of questions if they want to divide it that way some people put divide sections by if they put videos in it and just put their videos in one section if i just click on it i can just type in videos here and then if you incorporate a video that you want them to watch then you can in, um, ask a question here um, based off of that video that they watch so um, another thing here you can add so if you want um, the you know your students or whoever fill, who's filling out the survey if you want them to upload anything here you can do that you've got file upload over here so you can have them upload it if there's allow only specific file types if you only want them to upload something specific you can turn this on so that only they can upload an image or a pdf so you, as you can see you have eight different options here so um, based off of the different um, question type here is you've got some different choices if this is um, a question based off of date or time that you want the answer to be date or time you can put that here as well um, hey lisa i do have a question yeah so i used forms last year to kind of do some of our um post testing with the kids and pre posts with the test especially in math mm -hmm. And I ran into, I wanted them to be able to still show their work. Do you know of a way that you could import like a drawing surface within the Google form so they can still show their work as they enter the um, answer? Yeah, so. Right there, you, sorry. Yeah, no, great question, Christy. Do a file upload and then they could upload their drawing right here. Or if they needed to take a picture of it, um, you know they could take a picture of it and do image and they could upload it there because not everything and the you know is completed on the computer and sometimes we don't want everything completed on the computer so okay yeah great so they can upload their drawing or they can take a picture of it and insert it yeah okay if you want to say allow only specific file types if you don't if they can upload whatever you can turn that off but um it will let the kids know yeah. I have second graders, so I was wanting more of a pop over to a drawing surface. You know, like um, how you can get the drawing canvas on some of them. Yeah. So or you that could do, work too. Yeah, and you could just even go into Google Drawings, drawing.google.com, and have them use that. That's where I ended up sending them. Okay. But I wanted it kind of embedded within so that I could still have the Google form kind of check the answers, but then I still saw their work. Okay, yeah, perfect. I found when I did Google Drawings, I still had to print out each kids, and so I really wasn't saving the paper and I wasn't saving the time. It just, I don't know, wasn't quite what I wanted. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing, and great question there. Um, so Philip's talking about, you have to be careful with sections yeah good point um that's why um, with the section so when you have sections if you have anything required it won't let you move on to the next section so right here i've got some things required so here's a little trick that i've learned again it's what works for me it may not work for you anytime that i'm creating um google form with sections i don't make them required in the beginning so I would come down here, make sure required's turned off. Why is that? Because if I go up here to preview, I can preview the Google form, but I can't go to the next section. Um, I have to, in order to preview the Google form, the next section, I have to go ahead and fill it out. So that's why I um, don't make them required in the beginning. But then if I say, oh, I like this Google form, I'm ready, this is what I want the kids to see, I'll go and then turn on, um, go to each question here and turn on required. But in the beginning, I keep that off so then I can preview it because I like that preview feature um, just so I can see what it's going to look like. Do you have to do that? No, you don't have to, but that's I've just found what works for me. And then, yeah, Phillips also talked, I'm trying to read that here. 
he's also set a minimum number of characters for long answers to keep the student from just answering yes or no. So um, how do you do that? Great question. Philip, do you want to unmute and do you want me to um, pull up my screen and you walk it through, um, walk the participants through that or do you want um, to share your screen? Or none of the above? He'll let Mike do that? Okay. Oh, pass, okay. So anybody else want to step up and share how to do that? All right. Um, if I didn't wait long enough, feel free to unmute and interrupt me at any time. So what Philip and Mike were talking about, then if you're asking the kids to write, um, about something. So here, write about your favorite school lunch. Here, I've got it as a paragraph. So it's a long answer text. And I think this is what Philip was referring to in the chat that he sets a minimum length. So um, what you can do when you choose paragraph here, then I brought up the minimum length and it's under the response validation, the three dots here. So since I had already selected this, it, it came up. But how I got this here was with paragraph under response validation. I've got then also the length. So I've got the minimum character count and I put 75 for my minimum character count. You can change that, you can have a maximum. Let's say you don't want the kids to be too wordy. You can put a max in there and then if there is a custom error text here, you know, I could put, let's say they tried to submit it and um, it doesn't let them submit it. You can say, you know, please write more or please expand your answer so that when they are answering and it won't let them um, submit it, it'll give them this error. So what do I mean by that? If I go back here, um, to preview. Let's see, so this is what it's going to look like here for someone doing it. I'm going to go ahead and fill this out real quick because it's not going to let me go to the next section. Oh, I didn't realize how many required ones I had. Um, I'll just answer randomly here. Okay, so then I go to the next. So see, do you see why that's a, a pain? Oh, I need to go back because the answer, it was there. The question was there. Um, why it's a pain to have these required if you've got sections and you want to preview the sections. So right here, write about your favorite school lunch. So if I just put chicken strips down and hit enter, it's, it gives them the custom error text to please expand your answer. It won't let them go to the next section until they fix this error. And how do they fix that error? Then they write more. So I might want to go back here on that question then. I could say, please expand your answer and put down, you need a minimum 75 characters. Um, I usually don't, they just, when they see that they get that error, then they'll go back in and write more, or make it a complete sentence. But um, Mike or Phil, Philip, do you usually put down? What do you usually put down for the custom error text? Yeah, Philip, no worries. Okay, so thanks for sharing there in, in chat, but um, Philip, yeah, no worries that you don't have to um, share because, yeah, I was putting you on the spot and I just, it's my way of trying to, people who would feel comfortable and have stuff ready or will share. So I don't mean to um, put anybody on the spot there. So, yeah, that response validation is another great aspect. And I think Lisa also shared that um, digital escape rooms or um, you know, it's kind of choose your own adventure. Sometimes you can even do that in a Google Slides. You can do that here on Google Forms based off of how they answer 
um, the uh, one of your questions, you can have them direct them to go um, to another certain question. You can have them submit the form. You've got some options there. Also on Google Forms, make sure you know how to turn it into a quiz. Um, so be familiar with this gear up here, which is the settings. Um, again, on the level one, um, you had to know about the gear and the settings of how you can um, control some different things here on your Google Form. One thing I do wanna point out here on Google Forms, if you are using this in Google Classroom and you're having the grades um, import the grades from Google Form into your Google Classroom, you will have to set it to make sure it's set to limit to one response. Because um, there's been some errors of Google Forms not up, um, uploading the grades to Google Classroom. And there's yeah, some issues that we found out limit to one response. And, and there's a few other issues out there. I can pull up another slide deck that I have that I have that written on that we found. So any other questions about Google Forms or suggestions, things that you use it for? Lisa, I have a question. Yeah, Angela. Um, so I was using Microsoft Forms in the spring and I had problems um, like my students could turn in their answers, you know, late and it was hard for me to figure out how to know when someone has turned something in is, can you show like what that looks like here? Sure. Um, so I was just constantly having to check every single form for every section to see if anyone turned anything new in. And I felt like that was, it had to be something better <laughs> than yeah. that. Okay, yeah. thanks. Great question, Angela. A couple different ways I'm thinking of. You could, like Mike was showing earlier, changes to a sheet and just have the sheet open and so you, it timestamps it when they've completed it and the date. Um, another thing, um, if you go to these three dots right here, those three dots, again, know in Google that it's another menu, you can get an email notification every time a student completes the form, fills out for new responses. So that could be something else if you want it to notify you, um, because what happens, when you fill out the Google voucher form, and some of you might have already done this, I will get a notification um, based off of the Google form because it goes to a spreadsheet. Then that spreadsheet, I have to go and verify um, that you were in a workshop and um, I get an email notification of that instead of me keeping that up. Because some people may, you know, if they were in a workshop a month ago and they say, oh, they're ready for the exam, they want the voucher, they may go and fill out the form now. So I don't. I don't constantly check the form. So you can get an email notification when someone um, responds to that. Or, you know, if you know that it's rolling in like I did when I knew you guys were filling this out, I did keep it up in the spreadsheet so I could see real time who's in this workshop and, um, you know, hopefully adjust to meet everyone's needs. Those are two different ways I do. Mike, Philip, or Anybody else a different way? No, I'm, I'm going to jump in. I, I do it pretty similar. One thing that um, is important to remember, and I know you're going to segue in the classroom here in a minute, is I was working with some staff recently. And one thing that's important to remember, if you create a quiz in Google Classroom and you have it import the grades and all that stuff, that's all, that's all well and good. But if you want to see individual responses, to certain questions, Classroom's not gonna give it to you. It's only gonna show you three out of five, seven out of 10. Um, and so you have to actually go back to that form file in, in your drive and then look at the, the replies to that. Because um, I had a lot of staff at a training that were thinking that Classroom was going to show them the replies so that if a kid missed two, they could go see which two questions they missed. And I, you know, I, the way I taught it to them was think of, think of the form in your Google Drive as your stack of quizzes on your desk. Uh, your, your gradebook program will keep track of the records, but it's not going to tell you what they answered for question four. You actually have to go back to your stack of quizzes. So to look at individual replies, 
classroom's not going to show it to you. You've got to go back to the actual form that you created and check the replies there. Yeah, great. Thank you for talking about that, Mike. So this is what he was saying. You can go back to the form and under responses, you can see how they answered. Or you could even open up the spreadsheet to see how they answered that way too. So like Mike was showing, there's ways, um, there's different times that you wouldn't want to just use the form and look at how they answered that way. They automatically put down, put it in a chart. Um, and then there's times that you wanna do the spreadsheet and you might get used to one over the other. Again, differentiation, it's what works best for you. And um, it's nice to have the choice. The other thing I was trying to pull up um, was on the Google form and I can go ahead and I can copy this over here to this um, slide deck here. Here's some uh, people who have had problems with grade importing into Google Classroom. You know, make sure that the form is the only thing you have attached to the assignment. So only have one, one Google form attached. Um, if other documents or links are attached, this toggle will not appear. And this is the toggle that we're talking about. When you are, um, create, if you put in a quiz, then it automatically puts up this grade importing that this toggle, and I'll show you once we get into the classroom. Check to make sure that the quiz feature is set up properly with point values and correct responses. Ensure that the form set to uh, limit to one response, and that's what I showed you earlier here, that uh, under settings, limit it to one response right there. And then, oh, email collection is enabled. And then set the form to limit to users in your own domain. So I will, um, I can put that slide here in this slide deck here when we're talking about Google Classroom. You don't need to know that for the quiz. I just, since we are talking about forms, wanted to throw that in there. Anything else, Mike, or anybody else came across? Well, and when you um, have it for self-grading, like one or two word responses, you have to be careful too with formatting because sometimes it will mark something wrong because a capital letter, you know, if you type it in with a capital letter or how you space it, it looks for exact. So you sometimes you have to go in and manually, I've had to go in and manually grade it or change it in Google Form before I import it. Like if I had to edit the response, uh, edit the grades before I import it. Okay. Good. Point. I have that same issue with second grade inventive spelling. So when <laughs> I put in my answers, I have to think of all the ways my students might spell the word because of inventive spelling and how their spelling technology, spelling ability is a second grade. Yeah, exactly. And I've had trouble with in math, like with whether or not they put a space um, or how they denote multiplication or a fraction. Like, um, yeah, and so you have to be, you know, you have to try to think about all the different ways the kids might enter something in, a correct answer in, but enter it in wrongly, like if that makes sense. And, and then I still end up having to go in and double check to make sure that it graded it correctly. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Katrina and Chrissy. Um, Mike, is everything answered in chat or is there any other points that you wanna talk about? Again, I don't get to look at every single um, thing that's coming across in chat. So if we, okay, if Mike or I or anybody else miss a question you put in chat, feel free, put it in chat again or unmute yourself to let us know. Um, Google Classroom, you do need to be aware of Google Classroom. Um, some of the things, again, just how to create a new classroom, an assignment, and um, know about the grading. So if I go here, um, I can go to the waffle and go to my classroom um, and go to it that way, or I can type in classroom.google.com. And then if I go into one of my classrooms, just know about these tabs here, um, stream, classwork, people, and grades. And then the other key thing to know what do you guys think? What else should you know for the exam? 
the gear, the settings, how to manipulate and change things. Um, so um, just look through here if you haven't. Um, with Classroom, it, um, you know, I've spent two to four hour workshops. You can spend a lot longer with Classroom with people. Um, so I'll just hit on a couple things. How do you make, um, make an announcement, share an announcement with your students? Just come here, share something with your class, and here's where you can announce something. I can post it right away, I can schedule it, and I can save it as a draft. Um, again, it might ask, you know, share it to a certain class, um, and then share it maybe with certain students. So one nice thing here with um, Classroom, is that um, if, if you wanted to start with sharing something with class but you didn't want to push it out right now, um, you can do that as well. And you can come up here. If you save it as a draft, your drafts are uh, saved right here where it says saved announcements. I've got two saved. If I want to see them, hit the drop down arrow. Then the other thing here with classwork, if you go to classwork, this is where you can go and create um, your activities that you're sharing out just hit create and then you can do assignment quiz assignment question material and reuse post um, with these i will tell you you do have that separate section quiz assignment here and it creates a blank quiz as, uh, for you most of the time when i am um, you know pushing out quizzes i don't even go to the quiz assignment i can just go to create assignment and i can still push out a quiz um, why is that? Because I've already usually have my quiz created and I can just pull it from my Google Drive. And here in my Google Drive, oh, it's going slow right now. Um, so if I, you know, put in the one that I just had there, I can hit insert. It brings up grade importing. So that grade importing will automatically show up if you put in a Google form. Now, if I add another, um, can I add something else to this? I can, but then what happens to the grade importing? It goes away. You can only, if you want the grade importing to happen from your Google form, you can only have one, um, one thing, or one, you can only have the Google form in there. Because do you see how this just went over there? I can't toggle that on or off. So if you want to be able to toggle that on, you have to get rid of every um, other document that you've, um, and every other file that you've put in here. When I take that away, then the grade importing comes back and I can turn that on. Okay, so it's, I need to put a title for this. And then I guess, okay, it's already turned on. Um, and so then I can then push it out. If I wanna put instructions here, I can as well, but I have all of the same ability from just an assignment. I don't have to go and create a quiz assignment. If I did go that route, that was fine. I could go ahead and just click the blank quiz form that it created. Um, again, just know that how you can put points, you can put a due date, you can put it under a topic, you can add a rubric if you would like to. You can assign it to certain students, just like on the stream. If I shared out an announcement just to certain students, I can share this assignment with certain students. And then I can assign it to several classes. So let's say I wanted it to go to these three classes. Do you see how students is grayed out here? That means I can't select students. So if I wanna select students, I only select one class at a time. And then that's that. And then let's say I'm going to reuse this post. I can go and reuse this post for multiple classes as well. Again, I can assign this right now, or I can schedule it, or just even save it as a draft. So just, you know, again, for the exam, make sure you, you're familiar with um, these tabs up here, what's in the tabs, and how to create an assignment or how to create a question. So I know we're kind of limited on time if you have some specific questions about classroom. Um, 
we can help you with that as well. But um, if you look here, I don't know. Yeah, I didn't put a challenge here for classroom, but you know, go and create a new new class, create an assignment. I didn't show you how to create a new class. If you need me to show you that, I can. Um, I've got, again, a couple other links here that you can learn more about um, classroom as well. I, I can put a challenge in here if you want me to. Let's see, I can just pull it from the slide deck here. Mike, Philip, or anybody else out there, Katrina, Christy, anybody else out there want to talk about classroom, your experiences with your students, or? Um, I found when I was using classroom so much during remote learning, um, I was posting things to the stream. There were things that I didn't want to get buried. So in the stream, you have the options of moving it to the top. I use that a lot when I want something that is going to, I wish there was a way to like op on the, is there a way on the left where there's that margin to kind of tag or put anything off on the side there? Not that I'm aware of. I know it's been asked like, you know, how you said you can move it to the top yeah. and in some other programs, how you can pin it to the top. So it stays up there. Right. Yeah. That's not a feature, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if that would be a feature here in the future. What I did was I would put my assignments in there and then because I, so like if you went to classwork, what I would do then under classwork is where she's got all of those insert fam questions math, I would go ahead and move my assignment over there once it was an older assignment. That, so like I have math, reading, writing, um, social studies and then all I would have in my stream there is really the five that I needed right now or that were the most up to date and then I kind of use those as folders once the assignment was kind of over to move them over so I kept that first stream the must do's okay I like that yeah and that's with topics there's multiple ways to do that um, I mean if any of you want to share your screen and show your classroom you're more than welcome to just let me know um, Another thing you could do with this is you could start numbering your assignments. The purpose of that is then students, again, for some students, it may make sense, the numbering system, and then they could even do a search on the page, find on the page to find that. So, um, for example, I've got a couple of assignments right here. I have one and three. Let's say I wanted to search for the number two assignment. You can hit control F on um, a Chromebook or a Command F on a MacBook here. And let's say if I just um, named it number two assignment, I get 33 hits. So could you imagine the kid trying to find the second assignment? But if I have them using the number symbol and even if I went uh, one zero out, it would be fine. Um, but I went two zeros out and then the number, then it will take me right to the second assignment. Oh, here's a second assignment. Um, because like Chrissy was saying, your classwork page could get overwhelming. You know, if they're just scrolling down, you've got a lot there. You know, the kids, by putting it in the topic, you know, they could click on the topic and go there, but they may not know necessarily what topic to go to. Um, some teachers put topics by the week, so they know the week of July 20th, here's all of the assignments. Um, but I like how Chrissy said that she moves topics over, you know, or moves work over in certain topics that, you know, that's old stuff. And she just puts the new stuff right up here at the um, top of the stream. Or excuse me, I said stream, top of the page so that they the know thing, what they work on. The other thing is I work with second graders who are really still new at this. I'm probably their first exposure. So I like to keep it as simple and in their face, you know, not because I did try putting stuff in math, reading, writing, but then they'd forget which folder to check. Mm -hmm. So I liked just having it up there. I also sometimes color coded it so that it would be red and they would find the red thing was always reading, blue was always math. Um, that helped my kids find things too. Ooh, I like that. And Christy, you say second graders, you know, new to this, I find it even with adults, even with older students, this can be overwhelming. 
So what I've done is I actually create a classroom for each of my subjects. And then okay. they just toggle over onto the left underneath the bars. And then each, each subject has its own classroom and it kind of organizes it a little bit better. And then another suggestion, which I, um, someone shared in another training was using emojis on the assignments mm -hmm. and kind of categorizing with emojis. It's kind of like what you're doing with the numbers. Yeah. And yet you can see at a glance because you could see the emojis and find out which, you know, assignments went with which unit or it yeah. was interesting that she did it that way. Yeah, multiple ways. Thanks for sharing that, Melissa. And if anybody, anybody want to share their screen and share your Google Classroom? If you do, I'll let you give you a few minutes to think about that. Um, it is getting close to noon. So what I'll, I'll do is wrap up for the participants who need to get going. Um, what I do need you to do here, um, you know, I've got some other slides here about the, there's a Google level two checklist. I think maybe that came from, from, it doesn't say who it came from. I think this is Eric Kurtz. Does he have his name on it? We can look at it. Again, my internet's going really slow right now. Um, but I think that was Eric Kurtz who created that checklist. But I've got some links here, but if on slide 66 here, I've got this Google level two document. If you can put your Google site link in there, if you need help with that, let me know. Um, and then again, have this Google evaluation if you can complete. And then I will get all of this information over to ROE 11 and then um, they should get the um, ISB evaluation um, out to you within the next 24 to 96 hours. So if for some reason you don't have it, let's say today is Wednesday. Today's Wednesday, right? I say that. No, today's Tuesday. Tuesday? Now I'm second guessing myself. No, it's Wednesday. Okay. Uh, if Let's say if you don't have it by Monday, feel free to reach out to me. And... Um, I can see where they're at, but I've got to make sure I get them the, the sign-in sheet and then this Google Level 2 document. So um, again, thank you very much for um, joining us. And if you have any questions, reach out. Um, if you guys want to, I don't know, did I have you put down um, contact information here? Yeah. Um, you all can see other people's emails. Hopefully you guys are okay with that if you're not then don't put your email, but feel free to reach out to anybody in this workshop. It, what I love about these is we you know, can collaborate and learn from each other and help each other. So um, again, if you have questions, let me know, but good luck on your journey with um, the certification and then look for a training um, workshop. It, the earliest will probably be the, um, towards the end of August, I know that's when some of you go back to school, um, but um, it'll either be the end of August or September. So thank you again. Thank you to everyone out there who helped make this workshop a success, showing things, talking about things, sharing your, your stories. So have a great rest of your week. Feel free to stay on. If anybody wants to show their Google Classroom, you're, you know, you sure can. If you guys want to talk, um, ask each other questions, feel free to do that. I will go ahead and stop recording and um